Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. Um, my name is Sarah Weiss. I'm an executive editor at Ballantine. Um, and I am thrilled to be talking to you all today and be, to be joined in a second by Linda Holmes, who is um, the author of Evie Drake Starts Over and the new book, Flying Solo, uh, which comes out in June of this year, which we are so thrilled about. And I just want to take a second to thank all the librarians um, who are such an important part of what we do um, as publishers, have been such a huge part of my childhood. Um, and I just, you know, you'll see as Linda talks about Flying Solo that librarians also feature in her new book in a very special way. Um, so we're just so um, excited to be here with you, excited to talk to Linda about her new book. Um, if you don't know, Linda is, um, besides from being a novelist, she is also the host of NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour podcast, as well as a culture critic for NPR. And without further ado, I am going to bring Linda on up and we're going to talk about flying solo. So welcome to Linda Holmes. Hi, Linda. Hello, my friends. Hello. It's so good to see you. And I'm it's good so to see you too. Happy to be having this conversation with you. And as I know, um, we'll get into this group of folks that we're talking to today couldn't be more apropos for flying solo. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, it's true. It's absolutely true. This this book features a, a lovely and very beloved local library and a, a, a very beloved local librarian. So yes, exactly. So I'll hold up the jacket, the book one more time. It's probably a little hard to see, but it's a beautiful jacket. So I have to share it again. Um, it's coming out in June of this year. It's a great summer novel. And so Linda, can you tell us a little bit about this book? Yeah, so Flying Solo is um, set in Midcoast, Maine, which is the same in the same fictional town that Every Drake Starts Over was set in. And it's about a woman named Lori who has uh, grew up in this town, but moved to the West Coast and is now coming back because her very beloved great aunt, uh, who was 93 years old, has passed away after a, a long and adventurous life. And Lori is the member of the family who kind of agrees to be in charge of cleaning out her house. And so as she's going through her possessions, she finds a wood, uh, wooden duck decoy in the bottom of a trunk and becomes very fascinated by why it's there, why it's been sort of specially tucked away, um, why her, her great aunt had it. Um, and she just has a feeling that there's something about this duck. And so she begins to try to figure out um, the story of this beloved object and also begins to kind of unwind the story of her great aunt's life. Um, at the same time, she, Lori is dealing with her own stuff. She had canceled her, um, her wedding. She's about to turn 40. She had canceled her wedding sort of at the last minute. So she's smarting from that. And when she comes back to town, she has the opportunity to spend some time with both her, her oldest friend, um, who she's, you know, continued to love, but as we sometimes do, has, has not gotten to spend a lot of time with as she got older, but also her first love who still lives there and is, he is the town librarian and he's very locally beloved. And so she has a chance to spend time with both of them. She meets some new friends, um, and she has a chance to kind of, you know, enjoy both the, the, um, the allure of the town where she grew up and the mysteries of her family. And, and she learns a lot, I think. Yeah. It's, it's such a fun book because it's set, as you said, in Calcasset where um, Evie Drake was set, but we meet like a whole, we meet a whole new cast of characters. And I would also say people who have a slightly different relationship to the town. Um, right. Sure. Evie Drake, which is kind of interesting to read about. Um, and so I, I love this story. Um, you know, second novels are notoriously tough to write. I know this mm -hmm. one in itself with some challenges. And sure. not only were you up against the second novel blues, but you had to do so in the midst of a global pandemic, which is That's right. <laughs> which it has is, been going on. It has been going on if anyone had forgotten. So mm -hmm. I, I would love if you could tell us a little bit about um, what inspired you to write this novel? 
Yeah. So when the pandemic first hit, uh, I think a lot of people started, um, you know, catching up on a lot of the exciting television that they had missed and, you know, the exciting new and fabulous shows that everyone had been recommending. And then the pandemic lasted a little bit longer and you kind of <laughs> got through a lot of those and you kind of felt like, well, I've caught up on a lot of things now. And I've watched that show that everybody keeps telling me to watch. And I liked that. And then you kind of started moving into, you know, what, what else have I got? And one of the things that I um, came upon during that period was Antiques Roadshow. Old episodes of Antiques Roadshow, PBS Living channel on uh, <laughs> through, through Amazon is where I watched it. And, um, you know, I became really fascinated by these stories about old beloved objects and the way that people would show up with something. And it would be so clear that it was that within this object, there was the story of the family or the marriage or the household, um, you know, towns that went through changes, parts of the country that went through changes. And I became really fascinated by these kinds of objects. And also by the fact that, you know, the whole idea of how did you come to have this? And is this a, a real whatever it is? Is this a real example of whatever the thing is? And why is that important? And why do we care about that so much? And it, it started me thinking about, you know, beautiful old things. And I actually went to a friend of mine who, who you know, loves flea markets and antiques and uh, watches a lot of Antiques Roadshow also. Um, and I said, you know, here's the kind of story I'm thinking about. I need this kind of object. And he was the one who said duck decoys. So lucky for me, I had the right friend. <laughs> Very much so. I don't, it's such a cool, you know, we were all sitting at home watching like Tiger King and I don't know, everyone had their thing, their sort of rabbit holes that they went down into. Mm -hmm. and this book is cool too, because Dot, who is Lori's great aunt, whose house she's cleaning out, was somebody who who loved things and she mm -hmm. collected things and she lived a long life and she traveled everywhere and her house was sort of brimming with everything she collected and to your point like it's a little bit about like what you know we've all decided there's sort of a value to something based on certain you know uh, mm -hmm. i don't know and but we all value certain different things depending yeah. on what mean to us personal things i just and i think dot's story is really interesting in terms of like as you were just mentioning, like what what really does have value or how do each individual person kind of think yeah. about what has value? Yeah. yeah, you know, and I think I think in a very digital, you know, this gets a little um, this gets a little heady, but, you know, I think in a very digital world, um, I was a little bit fascinated by writing about the 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 tangible things yeah. that sometimes you don't find anymore. It turns out that Dot was a big fan of instant cameras and Polaroid pictures, which I actually have a couple of different instant cameras myself because I, I do still think, you know, a photo that is made in the moment that is a physical object is a, is a kind of a fascinating thing, especially the less people take them. So I was very interested in this idea of how we interact with with real objects um, as as everything kind of gets more more digital and more digitally stored. Right. Like an NFT duck decoy. <laughs> it's just a, it's just a different, you know, it's a different thing to hold something in your hand. And I think when you touch when you touch and hold it, an object that was really beloved by someone, that can be a really profound experience. And um, and and so that to me just was a rich, that was a rich source of, of story. Yeah. And I, I don't, I hope it's not spoiling anything to say that like, not only is um, there a librarian in this novel, but I would say Dot is also a great reader and books. Oh yeah. Art, physical books play their own part. And she was an avid um, library goer too. So she was, she was yeah. an avid reader. Mm -hmm. um, I, I must admit, and she would admit she had a bunch of library books in her house. You know, I'm sure they were correctly returned. <laughs> um, but yeah, she was a, she was a, a patron of the local library. Yes. Um, so changing gears a little bit, um, because we were talking about Dot, one of my f like favorite things about this book um, is that Dot um, has passed away, but she lived a really full life up until her 90s. Um, you have another character, Ginger, who for Evie Drake fans will recognize as the owner of the local baseball team. Um, and, and Lori, the heroine in this book, as you mentioned, is about to turn 40 and she's just um, canceled her wedding. Um, and so this is a book populated with women of a certain age, shall we say, um, or certain ages. And um, I would say 
um, women who are these ages are not usually featured so prominently, especially in romantic comedy. So curious about why you made those choices or what drew you um, to write about women who um, are kind of a little bit over the age of what we are sort of accustomed to with romantic yeah. comedy. Well, you know, the question that I, that I think it's fair to ask yourself is both, you know, what are you trying to write when you write about these women, but also why, you know, what are you trying to write when you write about exclusively 25 year olds? Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me, it was partly just the appeal of writing about different kinds of characters than I often ran into. Now, you'll often run into, um, you know, older women will be facilitators and caretakers and you'll run into them in fiction sometimes as your beloved grandmother who gives you romantic advice your beloved you know mother who who you know takes care of everybody and takes you in when you're sick these are really um you know women particularly you know dot and ginger who are in, you know in 90s and 80s and the the parts of the book where you're finding out their stories you know they are women who have their own separate tales of adventure and they have interests and they have you know their own romantic attachments and romantic histories and I really wanted to write about the way that sometimes I think um I, I think in, in you know I certainly grew up with a very limited understanding of some of my older relatives and all of the adventures that they had had and the things that they had done and tried and the places that they have lived. And there was, you know, there are moments when you know, somebody will tell you like, you know, your great aunt so-and-so lived in, you know, Germany and you'll say, really, you wouldn't have necessarily known. And it's amazing how things like that can turn up as you get older. And, you know, so one of the things I really like about this story is that Lori has an opportunity to, to learn even more about somebody that she was close to who maybe she didn't learn as much about when they were in this kind of more caretaker, you know, great aunt, you know, great niece kind of relationship. Right. Yeah. And not to go like, you know, too far off script, but I think another wonderful thing about this novel and that we certainly have talked about a lot is that Lori has called off a wedding um, and Dot is unmarried, was unmarried mm -hmm. throughout her life. Um, mm -hmm. And both, well, with Dot, you know, has has passed away um, in this book when the book opens, but both women um, are sort of making lives for themselves on their own terms and have mm -hmm. had to come up against sort of certain stereotypes, um, especially within sort of this small town. But I, mm -hmm. I think what's so interesting about this book too is that not only is it about kind of questions about, you know, singledom versus partnership, but it's also in some ways about um, solitude. Lori is, comes from a big family and uh, she mm -hmm. has many brothers and mm -hmm. grew up in a noisy household where she couldn't get a moment alone and would mm -hmm. often escape to dots for that, mm -hmm. for that quiet. And it's something she's kind of brought into her adulthood that she really values. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, just curious if you could tell us a little bit about why, you know, it's sort of an extension of this question about writing about women of, a, of, of an older age, but mm -hmm. also about women who are not driven only by the romantic plot line. Right. Well, you know, I, I, I've spent, I've spent a lot of time reading a lot of stories and, you know, watching a lot of films and, you know, whatever about women who, um, you know, believe that they want to be single, believe that they are happy being on their own. And then they learn they're not, they are actually, they actually desperately want to be with someone. They want to get married. They want to have children. They actually want all of those things. And what I wanted to write was a book that acknowledged that you can both love your solitude and your independence and your singleness and also long for some types of partnership and some types of, of companionship. And that maybe that wouldn't look, you know, maybe that wouldn't look exactly the way that it looked for your parents or for your favorite happy couple that you know, it might be whatever the shape of your own partnership would look like. And certainly, you know, there are plenty plenty of couples in real life who have explored and are exploring all of these models. But for me, it was interesting to think about someone who really grew up 
with only kind of that one model of yeah. the, you know, you could yeah. either be married like my, her mom and dad were. Right. And like some of her brothers are, or you could be single in the way that Dot was and live by yourself. And she's sort of uncomfortable, I think, between with both of those outcomes and trying to figure out where, um, you know, where her own wants and needs really fall. Uh, and not enough, I think not enough romantic comedy holds to the idea that what you want may be valid and you may still have a journey to go on. Um, and sometimes that journey is learning to live with and accept what you want rather than change what you want. Yeah. Um, and so those things are all really important to me. It, it sounds kind of more, when I put it that way, it sounds kind of more intellectual than it was to write, but I really wanted this woman to be happy um, and to feel like I had respected both her longing for a relationship and her, you know, to respect her desire to be on her own. Yeah. Um, I think that's so interesting, especially I've, I've been saying this a lot over the last few years that, you know, two things can be true at once. And I feel mm-hmm. like we lose that a lot um, in our daily lives or in just how we think about, right. um, you know, storytelling, I guess, in general. And so I think this is a, this is a, I think this is a book in which two things can be true at once. Right. And you know, nothing will make you think a lot about solitude, like a global pandemic in which for like 14 (laughs) months, I didn't see a per, I didn't touch a person except a doctor, like, because I live by myself. Yeah. Um, you know, and I thought a lot about the fact that it's, it's funny again, we're, we're, we're wandering a little bit, but you know, I, I, I thought a lot about the fact that oh, you know, the way I know that I'm not normally lonely in my day-to-day life as a person who lives alone is that I am lonely now. Mm -hmm. This is what it feels like when I'm lonely because I can't see my friends and I can't socialize and I can't go out to things. I'm not lonely when I can do those things. Um, I am lonely now (laughs) because now I'm really by myself. Um, So it really accentuated to me kind of the shape of desirable and undesirable solitude for me, which obviously is different for every person. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like probably I I also live alone and and thought I was an introvert, like a true, true introvert until this pandemic. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I still think I am to a degree, but I am much more needing of as as exactly what you said, which is that I think I went before the pandemic living alone, I was not lonely. And then I was. Um, And it was really it does Mm -hmm. force you to confront what you really need and what you really want. And I think this book is not a pandemic novel and it's something we also talked about in the editing mm-hmm. process, but mm-hmm. it does have, you know, it does have, it's sort of in conversation um, with those themes. Um, yeah. And, you know, I don't want to make it sound like it's a book that is solely about being by yourself. It's a book that is about these deep connections that Lori feels to friends and, you know, her ex-boyfriend and her family. Um, and it's really about how to, really honor those things and also respect kind of your own direction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I know we don't have a ton more time, um, but for everyone on this who's watching this, who was an Evie Drake fan, they will notice that this book, as we've said previously, is set in the same um, fictional main town, though it is Mm -hmm. not a sequel um, and it follows a new set of characters. But you know, I do think the Evie fans will will spot a few crossover characters, including Ginger. Um, so what was it like to revisit um, Kelcasset and, and and come back to this town, but to kind of explore a whole new set of, of characters? You know, as you know, Sarah, when I was trying to write this second book, I didn't really originally necessarily plan that it would be set in this place because I knew I didn't really have a sequel that I wanted to write to that story. But I think there was something about, I mean, it's it's so, you get so tired of chalking everything up to the pandemic, but I do think it made me, you know, I couldn't travel, I couldn't go anywhere. I think there was something about a place that I know and love and feel comfortable writing about that was just really inviting to me. Um, it is still a part of the country that I really love as it was when I wrote Evie. And I think I just, um, I think I just felt like maybe I'll go, you know, back there and wander around a little bit. It is different. You know, you and I talked about 
um, whether it was really possible to write a satisfying book that didn't go back to the same characters and didn't really give you some sort of a full, you know, let's revisit these, these characters, you know, who people, you know, were attached to in this first book. But ultimately, it was really fun for me to think of this town as both a, a place that is, um, you know, maybe the right place for some people and not the right place for everybody for different reasons at different times. And, you know, the, the point is not to, to make a place idyllic or nightmarish. It's just to say, this might be where you want to be and it might not, um, depending on kind of where, where you are. Uh, in your life. So it was, it was lovely to go back there though. I, I did have, to have a lot of fun picking out those kind of little places where maybe you would get a little glimpse of something familiar from, from the first book. Yeah. The Easter eggs are, are really fun. Um, but I also, I personally love that it's, it's its own book. It completely stands alone. And, you know, that the, th that we're seeing it's, you know, there are a lot of books that do similar things. I think of like Olive Kitteridge, um, which is also set in Maine, which had a kind mm -hmm. of kaleidoscope where you saw this town and these characters sort of pop up in different places and seen mm -hmm. through different lenses. So it's, mm -hmm. I, I love that you that you went back to Maine and I do understand the, the comfort of, of returning <laughs> to some place you knew yeah. that's familiar. Yeah. Um, so as, as, as everybody knows you, um, your, you are now a full-blown novelist, but you are also, and have been for a very long time, a culture critic for NPR. You host um, a culture podcast. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how your work at NPR and as a critic has both informed your work as a novelist, but then also vice versa, how, yeah. you know, how writing has, or writing fiction, I should say, has has informed your work as a critic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I like to think that the work that I did as a critic for a long time, made me more um, sp able to be specific about what I wanted and didn't want from a story written by me <laughs> in a way. <laughs> like this is what, th there is a fair amount of, I think both in Evie and in this book, there are some kind of um, explorations of trope. Um, there are some explorations of expectation. Um, and part of that comes out of having read and watched and listened to a lot of different things and had a lot of frustrations um, about patterns and about what you do see and what you don't see. In terms of how writing fiction has has influenced me as a critic, and I think um, the the biggest thing I would say is I when you've written a book yourself, when you've written a piece of fiction yourself, uh, and you've sort of pushed it all the way through to the end, especially a big, a big thing like a novel. Yeah. You do know a little more about story and structure than you did before, I think. Um, and it's not that it makes me um, harsher or gentler. It's that in terms specifically of thinking about a script, um, I think I am a little bit better equipped than I was to look at something and say, well, I wonder if the reason why they did it this way was that they were trying to fix this yeah. story problem because I've tried to fix story problems. And I think that experience has been valuable. Um, you know, so, so I think it gave me some actual tangible skills that, that have been really useful. And that's actually probably the biggest, the biggest way that those things have intersected. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's like sort of the mechanics of something which you sort of can understand in one level when you're just a critic, but then another, and, and you've always been a writer as well, but when you're actually- No, sure, but not not of fiction. And you know, as as you know, yeah. I mean, as I think you you know, when I wrote Evie, I there was a lot of kind of basic stuff about structure and writing fiction that I didn't know um, because my background, you know, I, I hadn't studied creative writing really as an academic. Um, I did make a lot of kind of basic errors that I learned about in the first, you know, in, in writing that book, just kind of basic stuff. And, um, you know, I felt like I took to it fine during that kind of lengthy editing process. But I think with this book, I came in with a better kind of grounding in how to do basic, you know, how to do basic structure, which does just take some it takes some learning and training. And, and fortunately I was able to kind of learn that 
um, as I went with the, with the first one, I've always been confident that I knew how to write, that I knew how to write a good sentence, but but there's a whole other thing that has to do with pacing and point of view and those kinds of things that you just have to learn the way you learn anything else. And I think I learned a lot of those things. Um, and I understand them a lot better than, than I did before. Well, I can just say you're a very quick study and the pacing in Flying Solo from the first draft to this finish, I mean, was it was basically perfect. So very, I was really impressed. I appreciate that, Sarah. <laughs> I, I was very glad we did not have to make it much longer and then much shorter and those kind yeah. of... Um, there was a little bit less of that kind of editing, I think, with this book. I totally agree. Um, okay, so last question before we wrap things up, which is, I know we talked a lot about this with um, Evie Drake, but we're publishing Flying Solo in June. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversations about a beach read, summer mm-hmm. read, what that means. Um, so I just, my question is, you know, you can tell us if you have, I, I've heard you say before, and I think you'll say again, that like a, a, a beach read is any book you want to bring to the beach, which I can yeah. really hear about. But I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that, that you wanted, like any other thoughts or also like what you're kind of like, what your reading has been like over the last few years and what you're looking sure. forward to reading this summer, what kind sure. of books? You know, I, I do believe that, that <laughs> a beach read is anything you read at the beach. And I think the biggest reason why beach read became an idea is that people often don't give themselves time to read fiction, except yeah. when they're on vacation. Many vacations are on the beach, <laughs> thus beach read. But I will say, I think for a lot of people, beach read brings about a um, an idea of reading pretty purely for pleasure. Yeah. Um, because a lot of the reading that we all do is you do read to broaden your mind. You do read to learn things. You do read to, to sharpen your understanding of, you know, sometimes if you're a writer, you're reading to kind of sharpen your technique by reading other people's work. That is all super valid. But I do think the idea of beach read calls to mind reading for the pleasure of reading, which I also think is a super wonderful thing to do. So, you know, those are when I read um, the things that I just love. Um, That is when I read a lot of, you know, um, either funny books or, and which is not, you know, none of this is to say these books aren't, don't also broaden your mind or whatever. I don't believe in those divisions. I'm just saying whatever is pleasurable to you, that's the only you know, that's the judgment. So that's when I read a lot of, um, you know, real soapy mysteries. That's when I read a lot of romantic comedy, similar to what I write. Um, you know, I just read, um, I was telling you, I just read, um, this book, the club, which is a, this kind of celebrities at a kind of weekend party Island kind of murder mystery. Delicious. Loved it. Um, had great fun with it. Um, And that's the kind of book that I think is a great vacation read, just because, first of all, you can gobble it all up in, you know, a day if if you have the time. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I don't I don't separate reading out, but I but the things I love to read in the summer when I am on vacation are things where I am able to really put down all of the external all of the kind of externalities of reading and go completely from, go completely from love. Yeah. That's such a good answer. And I, I feel like probably you and I would agree and probably everybody um, listening to this would agree. Like there's really no better feeling in the world than when you get kind of sucked into a book and just all you want to do is come back to it. Um, And to me, that's the measure of like what makes for good. I mean, any kind of reading, but especially summer reading, you know, you don't want to be like, oh, I have to get back to this. I have to finish this. You want to be like so immersed. So whatever that is, you know. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And sometimes those things are literary fiction and sometimes they're genre fiction and sometimes they're, you know, I think everybody's had those adventures where, you know, sometimes it's not the read that you expect and and maybe that's the, maybe that's the the greatest uh, experience. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Well, Linda, this has been such a pleasure. I could talk to you for another hour, but I, I know not, I will not do that to you. Um, but I just wanted to th- thank you for taking the time to have this conversation and thank you to everybody watching, to all the librarians. Um, thank you to your support. 
um, for all books, especially, uh, let's say, to for Evie Drake Starts Over and now for Flying Solo, which we're so excited to have out in the world in June. Um, and I just hope everybody loves it. And again, thank you for, for everything you do um, to support writers, to support reading. Um, it's really incredible. And I hope you love I hope you, I hope everyone loves the library and character in Flying Solo. <laughs> oh, I hope so too. And, uh, and here, here, and thanks so very, very much for having me and Sarah. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.